Go ahead. Sure. Uh, thanks, Paula. Um, it's really my pleasure to, to kind of be the first spokesperson for our new uh, Center for Integrated Catalysis. I first want to thank everybody who took the time to come to our first webinar um, today, which is going to be given by our director, uh, Paula Diaconescu. Um, so before we, uh, I introduce Paula, I just wanted to kind of uh, explain how we'd like to do questions and answers today. Um, what we'd like to do is use the chat function primarily. So I'll be the moderator for the, the questions. Um, and I, I think um, what would work best is if you just uh, ask your question uh, via the chat room. Um, and uh, I, I will ask the question to Paula, or maybe we'll just have you uh, ask out loud since you guys can have that capability. Um, so I'll just call on your name and you can ask your question. Um, so that's how we're planning on doing it today. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Paula Diaconescu. Uh, Paula is from Romania. She uh, got her bachelor's of science degree at the University of Bucharest in 1998. Uh, she worked on coordination complexes of transition metals and kind of got the bug of organometallic chemistry and inorganic chemistry. She then came to the United States in 2000 uh, around 2000 uh, to start her uh, PhD, which she did with Kit Cummins at MIT. Um, and she graduated in 2003 at MIT. In Kit's group, uh, Paula did some beautiful uh, chemistry of uranium, uh, airing bridged complexes of uranium. Um, and then in 2005, she started her postdoc at Caltech, which is where I met uh, Paula uh, for the first time. Um, I was a, a graduate student in uh, John Burkhoff's group. And Paula was a postdoc at, in Bob Grubbs' group, not doing metathesis though. Uh, she was working on a BP project and so she and I became pretty good friends uh, because the Burkhoff group and Grubbs group at that time were really uh, involved a lot in the uh, BP project. Um, and so uh, Paula and I became really close friends at that, at that stage in our personal lives. Um, she uh, uh, finished in Bob's group in 2005 where she started her independent career at UCLA. Um, where she currently is a full professor of chemistry. Um, while at UCLA, uh, Paula has done uh, many things uh, early on in her career. She continued her uh, interest in fundamental rare earth metal chemistry. Um, and also more recently, that's turned into a, an interest in electrophilic metals activations for small molecule activation. In parallel, uh, she also uh, began a, a very interesting and innovative program in redox switchable catalysis which uh, blossomed into probably the, the world's leader in this area. Um, and so I, I really enjoyed uh, my time talking with Paula and uh, I think our research interests overlap quite a bit as you will see in today's talk. Um, so it, in recognition for all of her great work, uh, Paula has been awarded many uh, uh, numerous awards, including a Sloan Fellowship, an SF Career Award, the Bessel Award, uh, which is a Humboldt Foundation Award, and the Guggenheim Fellowship. And finally, uh, you know, we're all here today because she is the director of our uh, new center, the NSF uh, CCI Center for Integrated Catalysis. Without further ado, uh, here's Paula to give a webinar on what is integrated catalysis. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, I hope everybody can see the presentation now. Um, thank you, Jeff, for the introduction, and thank you, everybody, for coming um, to our first webinar from the Center for Integrated Catalysis. Uh, when we posted the announcement of the center on Twitter, we actually got quite a few replies asking what is integrated um, catalysis. But before I tell you <laughs> um, what integrated catalysis is, I actually want to introduce um, my colleagues in the center. Um, you already heard um, Jeff Byers talking. He is at Boston College together with um, Dan Wei Wong. Um, and then going down the, the coast, um, Alex Miller is at the North University of uh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And then in Texas at University of Houston, uh, Lloyd Do. And coming back to UCLA, um, we also have uh, the group of my colleague, uh, Chang Lu. And you are going to hear them actually introduce um, a little bit of their research today. Um, in addition to the professors, I also want to introduce the students because a couple of weeks ago we had our first center meeting. So we had the opportunity to take um, screenshot 
picture of everybody who was uh, in the Zoom meeting. And the names, I'm going to go um, down the list. Uh, Matt Thompson is working with um, Jeff Byers at Boston College. Titran is working with Lloyd Doe at University of Houston. Henry Dodge is working with Alex Miller at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Ben Natinsky and Brandon Jolly are working with Chang Lu at UCLA. And then three of my students, uh, Hutan Roshandel, Amy Lai, and Yi Shen. And um, finally, I missed um, uh, Kishing Xiao working with also Jeff Byers at BC and uh, Hao Chuan Zhang working with Dan Wei Wang at BC. So initially I thought of postponing gratification and telling you what integrated catalysis is at the end of the talk, but I realized that would be counterproductive. So here it is. Um, Integrate catalysis is a system in which multiple catalysts carry out sequences of reactions. Um, the promise of integrated catalysis is to be able to make complex structures um, with, from simple feedstocks. So basically combining multiple building blocks um, and as simple as possible and getting to um, complicated materials. As you can imagine, the challenges um, in combining sequences of reactions or multiple chaotic cycles is um, the fact that a lot of times the different catalysts are not compatible. Um, a catalyst from one chaotic cycle is not compatible with reactants from another chaotic cycle, or a catalyst from a chaotic cycle is not compatible with a product from another chaotic cycle. So the six of us got together and <clears throat> decided that we would like to combine um, spatial and temporal control in order to overcome this um, incompatibility. And here are some examples of how we're thinking about it. Um, I'll start from the simplest, which shows that, for example, we can use electrochemistry to transform a monomer into a different or a building block into a monomer, and then combine it with another monomer, um, for example, to obtain um, alternating copolymers. We can introduce another uh, level of complexity by adding another uh, monomer or another reagent, which will react at some point and be controlled uh, with ex an external trigger. This is uh, what we know as switchable um, copolymerization, and I'll talk about switchable catalysis a little bit more in a minute. And then finally, here's even a more complicated example, where in addition to what I showed you um, at the, in the previous examples, now we want to generate one, another uh, one of our oxidants, for example, generated electrochemically, and then um, introduce that product at the end of, let's say, reaction number one, and then combine, have another reaction, and then basically um, precisely control where we can um, introduce monomers. You can imagine that for a transformation like C to happen, um, we would need to separate the catalyst spatially, and also sometimes have some of them turn on and some of them turn off. So this is what um, basically we would like to achieve by integrated catalysis. Um, why do we care or like why would anybody care about integrated catalysis? Um, first, like I said, because it allows um, us to build complicated uh, products from simple starting materials, the same as nature does. Um, and actually because um, this is how nature tends to carry most reactions. Here's a, a good example uh, from nature, the Krebs cycle, which um, is carried out in all um, aerobic organisms that basically takes um, acetyl coenzyme A from, that is generated from carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, so everything that we eat basically, into, source, into a source of energy through this um, many complicated steps, which I'm not going to discuss. On the other hand, we tend to carry one reaction at a time, and here's a simple example chosen a little bit on purpose um, of hydrogenation. Now, 
it doesn't mean that nobody has thought about combining multiple calendar cycles before. Um, actually, the field is relatively complicated. So I, um, I'm going to use a flow chart published by Tracer Lohr and Tobin Marks um, in 2015. And this um, basically is a nomenclature chart um, to tell you kind of like where you are depending on whether or not the catalysts are present when you start the reaction. <clears throat> Um, most, in most cases, we go down this line. Um, if we have multiple dependent catalytic events, um, and if they have uh, one or more, that go by one or more, more mechanisms. So we, we go down the line on ta to tandem catalysis, um, which can occur either starting with a single pre-catalyst, which can be changed into a different catalyst. Um, and this is also known as assisted tandem catalysis. Um, where switchable catalysis lies, basically. And I also want to point out that if we have multiple catalysts that are separated, um, so compartmentalized, then um, those processes are known as orthogonal tandem catalysis. And as I explained before, we're hoping to combine, basically, um, these two ends of this uh, flowchart. So today, I want to tell you, to give you some examples of switchable catalysis, talk a little bit, introduce the concept of spatially controlled catalysis, and hopefully I have time um, to tell you a couple of um, other related concepts um, that can um, basically um, give, give us inspiration you know, for what we do. Um, I hate to have this disclaimer, but while I was uh, putting this talk together, I realized that there are many examples out there um, and it's difficult to choose. So um, they are not exhaustive, and I am biased um, to, toward showing the work of my uh, colleagues in the center. So we'll start by talking about switchable catalysis. Um, I mentioned what switchable catalysis is, but here's um, a better way to look at it. We have a pre-catalyst that can exist in two different active forms that are interchanged by an external trigger. Um, this trigger can have different forms, as I'm going to tell you in a minute. And the idea is that each form of a catalyst <clears throat> reacts selectively with one reagent from a pool of reagents, carries out the reaction. And then basically the reaction is stopped when we introduce um, the trigger, which changes the catalyst from one active form to the other active form. And the other active form now starts reacting with another um, reagent from the pool of reagents. In this way, basically, if we carry out multiple switches, we can form um, complex structures like I uh, talked about before. Here, the, the example shown is for um, block polymers. I, I have a few um, new, ex new um, reviews shown here. Um, they go into a lot more detail. So like I said, there can be several types of external triggers. I'm going to discuss electron transfer, which can be achieved by the chemical redox reagents or electrochemistry. Um, some examples of chemical reagents, um, I'll tell you a bit about allosteric control, um, carbon dioxide control, and cation, cation control. Some examples of light. And then there are other types of switches that I won't discuss, like mechanical or thermal switches. So because actually um, my group started working in switchable catalysis some time ago, um, inspired by the work from Mark Wrighton's group, I want to um, tell you about it first. In 1995, um, um, Mark Wrighton's group at MIT reported um, that this cobaltocinium bisphosphine rhodium catalyst can um, react selectively or with different rates depending on the oxidation state of cobaltocin. So for example, the cobaltocinium catalyst was a better hydrocylation catalyst, um, whereas the cobaltocin catalyst was a better hydrogenation catalyst. And then um, Mark Wrighton's work was continued by a few groups, but it wasn't until um, 2006 that actually I thought the idea was very nicely um, applied to loctide uh, ring opening polymerization um, by Nick Long's group at Imperial College. And they 
devised this titanium bisisopropoxide um, complex that has two ferrocenes <coughs> at the periphery of the molecule that basically when the ferrocenes are iron two can um, catalyze ring opening polymerization of loctite with a higher rate and then if an oxidant is added that transforms ferrocene into ferrocenium the reaction rate decreases but it can actually increase again um, similar to what it was before if the ferrociniums now are reduced back to ferrocene. So I started at UCLA um, in case you followed Jeff in 2005. So this was, um, I thought this was great inspiration. We were interested in ferrocene diamide complexes at the time and decided to actually um, change a little bit the idea from Nick Long's paper. So instead of having ferrocene at the periphery of the molecule, we wanted to bring it closer to the metal center, but um, keep the metal complex architecture relatively simple. So we, we like this shift-based type metal complexes. Um, we started originally with yttrium and cerium complexes, and then found out that um, basically we can turn the ring opening uh, polymerization of loctite on and off, similar to the titanium complex that I uh, showed before, um, by basically changing the oxidation state uh, at iron. So for yttrium, the ferrocene complex works um, with loctite, the ferrocenium doesn't. What um, the student working on that project found at the time was that if we go to a different Lewis um, acid that is similar in size to yttrium, um, which is indium, basically in group 13, we see complementary behavior. So now the ferrocene complex does not work, whereas the ferrocenium complex works. So what we hypothesized was that at the time was that um, basically somewhere in the periodic table, we might be able to find a metal complex which can actually balance um, the properties of the two, yttrium and indium. And um, I had the new postdoc join the group, uh, Shinke Wang, and he wanted to um, modify our ligand design a little bit and came up with um, this basically ONNO and OSSO type um, architectures. And we relatively quickly found out that a titanium complex supported by an OSSO ligand can polymerize um, loctide in the reduced form, but not caprolactone. But if we add an oxidant and change it to the ferrocenium complex, now we can start um, polymerizing caprolactone. And in this way, we actually um, could synthesize dibloccopolymers of loctide and caprolactone. Um, a little bit later, we found out that a zirconium compound in the series um, can react with more substrates and um, basically in the reduced state, um, has activity towards loctite, beta betrolactone or succinic anhydride, whereas in the oxidized state reacts um, cleanly and actually orthogonally with cyclohexene oxide, propylene oxide, or oxidane. And in that way, because the reactions are pretty well controlled, we could actually generate triblockopolymers. Um, we used um, sequential addition for the last one since loctite and beta betrolactone copolymerize. But basically, uh, we showed that we can make a dibloccopolymer by going from the reduced compound to the oxidized compound. And then when we went back to the reduced compound, we added beta betrolactone and generated an ATC triblockopolymer. So now um, I would like Jeff to actually talk a little bit about his work on switchable catalysis. Thank you, Paula. Uh, that was uh, great. And so this is. I, when Paula's uh, research came out, I was really excited. I remember talking to her at a Gordon conference about um, the, the possibilities of this chemistry. And at, at, in parallel with her work, uh, our group was also developing these iron-based complexes for uh, lactide polymerization and olefin polymerization. And we uh, were uh, very much um, inspired by Paula's work, and we, we were wondering if you needed the ferrocene at all to do the redox switching if you use a redox active element at the center of the catalyst. And so uh, we, that's when we started exploring redox switchable polymerization as well. And so on the left of this slide, you can see our original system where we have the iron two compound that can re undergo redox reactions to make an iron three 
And just like Paula's system, we found orthogonal reactivity with the iron two being active for lactide on the left and uh, inactive for epoxide on the right. Um, and the iron three having the reverse reactivity being active for the epoxide in the center and inactive for the lactide on the left. Um, one of the interesting things about these iron-based complexes is that the bisaminopyridine ligands are redox active. And so you can actually access lower, lower oxidation states on the, on the right-hand side of the slide. And these ended up being very active for different kinds of monomers. So more recently, uh, we have discovered that these kinds of uh, uh, low-valent metal complexes are active for in carboxy and hydride monomers, which form polyamides. Um, and inactive uh, in the oxidized state. And so they provide complementary reactivity, again, with the epoxides. And so, uh, next slide, please. Uh, what we have been able to do is, just like Paula's group, we can synthesize block copolymers by sequentially adding um, oxidants or reductants um, to make lactide epoxide copolymers. We've also, uh, uh, next slide, please. We've also been able to do cross-linking reactions with this monomer that incorporates both a lactide unit and an epoxide in the same molecule. And using the redox reactions, we can then control the cross-linking density by, by adding the oxidant at the appropriate time. And by doing so, we can then vary the properties of the cross-linked polymers, um, such as uh, the, the, the glass transition temperature shown in green here, um, or uh, the swelling properties of this polymer. And so uh, cross-linked polymers are difficult to control definitively. And this Temporal control gives us some access over control over these redox, or excuse me, uh, cross-sync properties. Next slide, please. We've also um, re more recently developed an electrochemical way to do switching. Um, so instead of adding chemical redox reactions, uh, we teamed up with Dunway Wang in our, in our department here at Boston College to try to figure out how to replace that chemistry with electrochemistry. And as you can see on this slide, here we're starting with the inactive form of the iron for lactide polymerization, when we expose it to an oxidizing potential, uh, we can then turn on the polymerization reaction. Click forward, please. And you can see the molecular weight after that initial time period it, uh, is well controlled, just like um, the polymerization that was activated with uh, redox reagents. And so next slide, please. We've been able to use that to once again synthesize the block copolymers, this time replacing the redox reagents with electrochemistry. Next slide, please. But more recently, we've been thinking about uh, uh, supporting these onto surfaces. And so this is some un unpublished work that we uh, started with in collaboration with Dunway's group, where we have been able to support the iron complexes onto, ta onto titanium nanoparticles using this protonolysis reaction that we have uh, developed for the synthesis of iron alkoxides we can utilize the same kind of reaction on titanium oxide surfaces to suspend the iron onto titanium oxide. And those end up being very good uh, heterogeneous catalysts for the polymerization of lactide, as you can see on the, on the bottom here. Next slide, please. We were then able to, to pattern these polymers. If we made electrochemically isolated zones, we can then expose one zone of the, of, of the slide to oxidizing potential, which then turns the iron two to an iron three on the one side, but leaves the iron two on the left-hand side of that slide. So then when you expose that to a mixture of cyclohexene oxide uh, followed by lactide, you get patterning of these surfaces, which is dictated by the oxidation state of the iron complex on the surface, as shown with the Raman spectrum uh, mapping on the top left and right. So all this was done in collaboration with uh, Professor Dunway Wang, who's, who's been a great collaborator and I'm very happy to continue this work in the center. And at this time, I'd like to hand off uh, 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 the talk to uh, Professor Wang to talk about his research. Thank you very much, Jeff. So when I actually learned about the switchable behavior of catalysis, this was very new to me and I was very excited. And I was excited partly because we spent a lot of time to think about uh, the surface and how to actually uh, force or take advantage of electron transfer at a surface, at the interface of a, a heterogeneous uh, nature of a solid, for instance, and a solution. For instance, other ongoing projects that are related to that that inspire me to think about problems like this include, for instance, on the top left corner here, we have the uh, a project uh, where we actually think a lot about how to oxidize water, very simple reaction, and yet 
a lot of unknowing. And then from this effort, we actually uh, developed an interest of anchoring molecular catalysts, which works really well as we learned from Paula and Jeff, uh, but they, their stability tend to be not uh, ideal. So we actually uh, learn how to anchor this catalyst onto a surface under extreme conditions. We try something crazy. We remove all the ligands of this uh, complex and maintain their structure. So this is where we actually call them, you know, heterogeneized uh, catalysts. And this uh, allow us to uh, carry out projects uh, concerning photocatalysis for conversion of small molecules such as methane. And the, uh, our interest in this electrochemistry also has driven our efforts, has, uh, driving, has been driving our efforts in developing new technologies to take advantage of this electron transfer uh, for their ability to store uh, energy, to store electrons, for instance, for the uh, development of metal air battery, which is funded by uh, NSF as well, separately. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, for instance, just diving a little bit of the electrochemical aspect of this, this is something I spend a lot of time thinking about. For instance, when we actually uh, introduce reactive species, we care a lot how they interact with the electrolyte system. And that was, a, that was an enabling factor in the collaboration with Jeff, uh, because we uh, spent a lot of time thinking about how to design the counter electrode, how to manage the ions, counter ions, to avoid cross-contamination. And uh, this is really uh, being learned from our efforts uh, in understanding uh, metal air batteries. Next slide, please. And uh, you know, overall, this gives an overall view because I'm relatively new to the field of uh, organometallic uh, chemistry. So give you an overall view of uh, my research. So uh, I was trained uh, as a material chemist, but you know, recently got very interested in the catalysis, particularly at the uh, solid liquid interface. And our goal is to try to develop application that will be of uh, important societal impact. Next slide, please. And this is another example that I was trying to say that when we do crazy things to the molecular catalyst, and sometimes they work pretty well. And in this particular example, we took the iridium uh, uh, complex that was borrowed from uh, Yale group, uh, uh, from Gary Bradwick group. And uh, when, we will, when we anchor them onto metal oxide surface, we were able to knock out all the ligands and but maintain the distance between the two iridium atoms they actually work really well for a number of reactions, including water oxidation, CO oxidation, methane oxidation. So we're very excited uh, where this is leading us. I think this is it. Uh, I'll hand it back to Paula. Thank you, Danway. So um, now I actually want to go and tell you a little bit more about other types of switches. We talked about electron transfer, um, I would like to introduce the concept of chemical switches, um, which can be used for various things. Um, the idea of allosteric control was uh, introduced by Chad Merkin's group. Here is um, an example that I like. It's basically, it looks very complicated. It's an aluminum ethoxide that at the ends of the molecule um, has two rhodium bisphosphine groups. Um, and basically, the, one of the phosphines has an amine with large aromatic rings, um, groups actually, and if the chloride is abstracted from rhodium, the amine can coordinate, and that actually blocks access to aluminum, top and bottom. And this was used to control the ring opening polymerization of caprolactone. So the aluminum compound works when the amines actually don't block access, but doesn't work when the amines are coordinated to rhodium. Um, another example um, that I like, um, and particularly I like the work of Charlotte Williams's group at um, Oxford University because they also um, generated um, block of polymers. And it's, um, this work is based on uh, metal complexes again, that can carry out, for example, the um, copolymerization of epoxide and carbon dioxide. And they discover that if they take the carbon dioxide um, away, but they have some um, excess epoxide, um, if they add 
um, another monomer, so caproloctone in this case, they can actually polymerize caproloctone and that the polymerization of caproloctone stops when carbon dioxide is added uh, back. And in this way, they actually have generated multi-block of polymers. Now, I would like to have uh, Lloyd Do talk about his work on um, cation switching uh, catalysis. Thanks, Paula. So we were very inspired by the switchable catalysis work that Paula's group has done and Jeff and many others but we really want to expand the sort of the tuning capabilities of, of these catalysts. And so we started to explore binding of secondary cations as a way to modulate the reactivity of old polymerization catalysts. So at the top cartoon is kind of the general idea of our design. We start with some catalyst platform and then we install a secondary metal binding group so that we could coordinate to a secondary metal. And so the idea is that the periodic table, it has such many different metals that we can take advantage of their charges, their sizes, the Lewis acidity, and many other properties that pot potentially could benefit our catalysts. So since 2013 is when my group started and we've developed a series of uh, different platforms, including the nicopenosic imines, the phenoxyphosphine, and the phosphine phosphonase. These are our, our most interesting examples so far. And all of them have a very similar um, feature, which is having this polyethylene glycol group um, to capture the secondary metal. And so I won't talk about the details of the ligand design, which I will describe in a webinar in November. But what I want to say here is that we basically demonstrated that this is a general strategy that by installing a secondary metal, you can actually modulate um, the properties of, of the primary catalyst. Next slide, please. And so one of the challenges in creating um, these catalysts is being able to control their nuclearity and being able to um, understand their, their binding behavior. And so one of our goal to experiments when we, we, we make these complexes is to do titration studies to understand um, if they actually form the, the, the structure that we, we originally designed. And so the top example, um, nickel L2, is just a nickel complex with this phenoxyamine ligand but we introduce a polyethylene glycol chain. And so the top example has only two ethylene groups. So you can see that as we add in sodium barfate, the barfate is just a non coordinating anion, you can see optical changes starting from the black trace. As we add in more sodium, we see coordination of the complex, of the sodium to the complex. And so if you notice, um, if you look really carefully, you notice that initially we develop an isospecific point, but then it disappears as we add in more sodium. And so if we, we fit this, um, this binding data, we basically um, think that it's a two e binding equilibrium where we first bind the sodium to make a nickel sodium complex. And then because of the flexibility of the peg arm, it can actually bind a second nickel to form a trinuclear species. And the, the second example, um, nickel L4, this one was really interesting because when we extended the peg chain by adding four ethylene groups, now, if you look at the UV vis plot, as we add in the sodium, we see very beautiful isospecific points suggesting that we do form discrete nickel sodium heterobimetallics. And we can characterize um, these complexes by X-ray crystallography as well. So we have independent confirmation of the structures. Next slide, please. Um, another thing that we do is that we try to find correlations and understand how the secondary metals affect the reactivity of the catalyst. And this plot here looks really busy um, but basically, on, on the x-axis, what we are showing is that we have four different complexes, nickel L0, L2, L3, and L4, where they have different chain lengths of the, the polyethylene glycol chain. And we're looking at the correlation between the binding constant with various alkali metals and the turnover frequency of the catalyst. And so probably the one that sticks out the most is nickel L4 and sodium. So notice the blue dot and the red diamond are basically um, much higher than the others. Um, that just shows that the, the tighter the binding of the cation um, leads to the greater of, um, activity of the catalyst. And so basically with, with these data, we can basically show that the active species of the catalyst is indeed heterometallic rather than monometallic or um, other decomposition species. Next, please. And just to kind of conclude with this particular phenoxyamine system, um, we can show that the mononickel complex is, is stable. Next. And it's active. If we add a substoichiometric amount of the secondary metal, we can form a trinuclear species, which we've shown that is, is less active. 
And then if we add in one equivalent of the salt, we can get the heterobimetallic, and this is significantly more active. So in addition to changing activity, we can also modulate things like polymer molecular weight, the polydispersity, the distribution. So I think that we've really, there's really a lot to explore with this system. And um, I'm happy to talk more um, in, in my, my talk in, in November. But so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Alex Miller, who will give us some more insights into cation controlled catalysis. Thanks, Lloyd. Uh, it is, uh, I have to say, really cool to share the virtual stage with so many chemists uh, that I've uh, admired their work for so long. So it's been really fun uh, so far. And um, I'm happy to talk a little bit about our own approach to um, controlled catalysis and switchable catalysis. We've come at this from um, a perspective sort of distinct from polymer chemistry. I've, I've done very little polymer catalysis and so I'm, I'm learning about that through the center which is fantastic um, and um, instead we've been thinking about small molecule transformations and particularly about the role of hemilability in uh, catalysis and hemilabile ligands have one uh, or more strong anchoring donors and then uh, weaker ligands that can dissociate reversibly during catalysis uh, and this ends up being um, uh, crucial to catalytic activity in many systems. And so we were thinking of ways where we could control uh, the extent of hemilability, which oftentimes is gating the ability of a substrate to bind to a metal center. Um, so we designed uh, a series of catalysts based on um, uh, the uh, phosphine donor and a phenyl donor, and then incorporated an AZA crown ether macrocycle. Um, and uh, in this slide, I'm showing you an example of uh, a sort of an on-off switchable isomerization reaction um, where the site cis to the hydride where an olefin will bind before insertion uh, and isomerization is initially filled by a chloride ligand. And this is uh, substitutionally inert. And so uh, that's an inactive catalyst. And you can see in the plot that when we start with that catalyst and add substrate, uh, there's, there's no discernible reaction. In this case, uh, just initially, we're using sodium ions as a halide extractor. We precipitate sodium chloride and form a cationic version of the catalyst, where now cis to the hydride is a hemilabile ligand, this weak ether donor. And uh, that can reversibly dissociate to, be, to allow the olefin to bind, and so you have an active catalyst for olefin isomerization. And so, because we can do these um, transformations in situ, we can add chloride back in to reform the inactive form of the catalyst and then add sodium and go back and forth between these two uh, different states of the catalyst. So on the next slide, um, what we wanted to look at was something a little bit different than switchable catalysis, but whether we could actually have a, a fine degree of tuning over the catalytic rate um, by reaching a third catalytic state. Uh, and the idea was that when the uh, ether oxygen dissociates from this cationic species in the orange uh, catalytic cycle at the bottom, um, it reveals uh, a, a sort of macrocycle that can bind the cation. And that can engage in the second, secondary equilibrium of cation crown interactions, which can um, uh, make substrate binding more favorable. So, um, this modestly active catalyst uh, that we started with, with the turnover frequency of about two per hour, um, can um, spe specifically be activated by different um, alkali metal cations. So in this case with four oxygen donors, it's quite uh, selective for lithium activation where in the absence of any salt, the reaction is quite slow, multiple days to go to 80% uh, conversion. And uh, when you add an equivalent of lithium, uh, the reaction finishes in, in 15 minutes with high yield and, and high selectivity. So we attribute that to this cation crown interaction, stabilizing the olefin bound. Um, and, and thus, the rate of reaction then is tuned by how much lithium we have in solution um, or based on the identity of the cation. So if we have sodium ions, uh, the reaction speeds up, but not as fast as when we have lithium ions. Um, okay, so on the next slide, um, I'll, I'll change gears entirely. This is something um, totally different that our group does that we don't often think about even as switchable catalysis. We have an interest in sort of applying organometallic catalysts to um, energy applications um, such as um, light-driven hydrogen evolution. Um, and we've been studying um, catalysts that are able to um, 
electrochemically be converted into metal hydrides that can photochemically generate hydrogen. And um, this sort of serves as a bridge between sort of the, the electrochemical switching Paula talked about earlier and Jeff talked about earlier, uh, and photochemical switching, which we'll hear about in a little bit, where these are systems that can be um, in contact with an electrode and can be electrochemically reduced and then um, photochemically uh, turned over such that we have a photochemical switch on the activity of these types of systems. So we've used these for hydrogen evolution as well as for applications in um, uh, organic reductions like these um, uh, uh, hydrodehalogenations um, of chlorinated substrates. So with that, I'll turn it back to Paula. Thank you, Alex. So Alex introduced a little bit um, photo switchable catalysis. It's actually photocatalysis or light mediated reactions um, were classified as three different groups by uh, Chris Bielowski back in 2013, um, and I'm sure there are by others. Photocatalysis um, is when actually the catalysis is done by the excited state of a catalyst. Um, photo cage catalysis is when a catalyst has a light activating um, group that basically changes by light absorption, light absorption group. Um, and then the catalysis happens in, with the form of the catalyst with the excited um, light, absorb, um, light, light absorption uh, group. And then photo switchable catalysis is actually um, similar in a way to photo cage catalysis, except now each form of the catalyst can carry out um, a different reaction. So with the light absorption group in one state, the catalyst can carry out one type of reaction. And then um, when that group gets excited, the catalyst can carry out another reaction. There are many efforts in this area. Um, I picked a few. Um, I uh, want to show you an example from Chris Bielowski's group uh, on this ruthenium olefin metathesis catalyst. They use this n heterocyclic carbene with thiophene groups um, substituted. And basically, uh, in this form, ruthenium can carry out ring opening metathesis polymerization and basically um, form a polymer. If the NHC absorbs UV light, basically the two thiophenes form a carbon-carbon bond that changes the conformation of the carbene and the reactivity of the ruthenium center um, to ring-closing metathesis. And here's an example of uh, ring-closing metathesis of a dye. Another example um, that I like is from um, uh, Stefan Hecht's groups in Germany. And this looks a little bit more complicated, so I'll walk you through it. They use um, dye arrow thiophene ethylene um, molecule, which has actually a um, phenol functionality, which can bind monomers through hydrogen bi binding. In this form, the phenol can react and activate loctide. They use an amine as a co-catalyst. Um, and in, basically, in that way, the loctide polymerization can occur. If they hit the system with UV light, then basically there is a carbon-carbon bond formation here that changes the phenol to this structure, which thermally can undergo an enol ketone polymerization. And basically, um, the original phenol loses the ability to form hydrogen binding, um, and bonding, and because of that, the lactide reaction doesn't work. And they applied this to actually copolymerization of um, trimethylene carbonate and valerolactone um, in the open form in the presence of DBU. They form um, one type of polymer where TMC reacts, the uh, trimethylene carbonate reacts uh, slower than valerolactone. And then in the closed form, they form another type of polymer where um, actually trimethylene carbonate reacts faster than valerolactone. Okay. There, like I mentioned, there are uh, other examples of switchable catalysis, <clears throat> but I also want to introduce a little bit the concept of spatially controlled catalysis. One of the um, earlier, uh, none of the examples are very old, but uh, one of the earlier examples that I like 
um, actually um, comes from Marcus Quex group, was reported in 2015. And we are now starting to look at spatially separating catalysts. They use um, amphiphilic triblocopolymer that basically <clears throat> um, has the different blocks can bind to different um, types of uh, precatalysts. So the core is hydrophobic and can bind the cobalt porphyrin that can basically um, do um, hydration of alkynes to make a ketone which then can diffuse out to the outer shell, to the outer um, layers, um, wh which now are blocks that are hydrophilic and can bind the rhodium complex, which can carry out hydrogenation and actually um, <coughs> asymmetric hydrogenation of the ketone. I have another um, um, example, a little bit uh, more recent. This is from the Liu Group in Shanghai, uh, published in 2019. This is, a, again, a little bit more complicated, at least for me, all this uh, comfort mineralization um, catalysis is a little bit complicated. It's basically um, silica, mesoporous silica core with a thermo, thermoresponsive polymer on the outer shell. The core um, can bind a chiral ruthenium catalyst, and then the um, polymer shell binds an asymmetric, so normal um, Suzuki, uh, for example, catalyst. If, since the polymer is thermoresponsive, in the open form, substrates can reach the inner core and react with the rutidium catalyst, and that can carry out asymmetric reactions. Whereas in the closed form, now the reactions happen on the outer shell, and um, they're not um, asymmetric, but they can happen um, but different reactions can happen depending on the temperature. So a Suzuki coupling at 60 degrees and the um, reaction between amines and enones at uh, 15 degrees. Okay, um, we wanted some expertise in spatially controlled catalysis. So we asked um, Chang Lu to join us. Chang, please take the floor. <laughs> Thanks, Paula. Um, I was a bit sick, so um, I may cough a little bit during the talk. Um, yeah, thank, it's my pleasure to talk about my research and our contribution to the CCI Center. Um, I started UCLA three years ago, and my expertise actually come from electric chemistry, nanomaterials, and catalysis. When I thought about that, actually, about electric chemical nanomaterials, we think about what fundamentally happened at a microscopic scale. First, as you see on the left side of the screen, you have a charge transfer. So you convert an oxidized species to an reduced species. And then because there's a different concentration near the surface of the electrode versus in the bulk, you got to have a mass transport. So there's going to be a gradient generated at a steady state. So when we, th we thought about it, we can think about using electrochemical nanomaterials as a way we transduce electronic signal like voltage current as a function of time in a spatially defined pattern into a we dictate a concentration gradient like the oxide species and the reduced species their concentration as a function of time and space. And furthermore, we can say it is using electronic signal control the free energy and the entropy of a non-equilibrium state in, in temporal and a spatial manner. So in that case, what we think about is we can using electrochemical nanomaterial to control, uh, generate a lot of non-equilibrium, non-steady state dissipative systems. And that may not only apply to chemistry, but also apply to biology. So what we are not going to talk about in detail here is part of my research actually, how are using the idea to create local microenvironment for biology, which is sponsored by NIH. We are using electronic nanomaterials to control the local environment and study microbiomes and the microbiota and the micro and biofilms, which are relevant to environmental and health issues. And it's, uh, along with that route is how we can use machine learning to design a appropriate nanomaterial and morphology and what kind of spacing we need and what kind of electronic input we need to generate a desirable free energy landscape in space and time. So that's a general overall about, about what my lab does, but I like to talk about what we can, how we can contribute to this center. The old day back to when I was a grad student that I work on sort of hydrogen generation solar fields. And here I'm showing you some of my 
PhD work actually a couple of years ago, we can actually have a very good control about making nanowires and nanomaterials and a spatially defined what where you want the reaction to happen. As you can see here, there's a kind of two blocks of nanostructures on hundreds of tens of nanometers. You can have tiny titanium dioxide nanowires doing oxygen, water oxidation reaction on the sunlight, and a well on the lower part, the silicon will do proton reduction. And those two active sites are about tens of microns or micrometers away from each other. So I think nowadays it's possible we can make nanostructures with a very high precision and dictate where um, we want this kind of reaction to happen. So, how, so with this kind of expertise, I like to say what we can do to do spatially con controlled catalysis. So one thing I sometimes I joke with my group members of what we do about this, we basically make glove box and microscopic scale. So we, when, we, when we have a nanowire electrode, as you see on the left side of the screen, on the electrochemical potential that can consume oxygen, we generally have actually are generating a micrometer scale glove box in air. So we thought about it, that's kind of neat, right? You have a free oxygen free zone, not far apart and a few micrometer away, it is pure full of oxygen. And it is a possible we can take advantage of that to make some catalytic cycles maybe we haven't thought about before. So we tried to demonstrate idea in our recent publication last year saying that is it possible we can build a catalytic cycle and one step of that is very sensitive oxygen but the other step of the component of the clay cycle requires oxygen. You wouldn't have that in homogeneous media because it's, it's contradictory to each other because of their oxygen demand. But we thought about well, if you have a micrometer size glove box, you can do that because the redox, because the active species can hop in and do one turn, turn over in the absence of oxygen and it can come out of it and then do oxygen, a turn over that requires oxygen. So we demonstrate the idea using a metallo rhodium metallo puffering radical, which are very sensitive to oxygen, but can act in methane in the absence of oxygen to met rhodium methyl uh, species. And we further demonstrate you can couple that with the oxygen to, gen to make a uh, methanol by, and by using a micro glow box so the rhodium-3 methyl species can diffuse out and the react to the oxygen generate methanol group and then get regenerated back thanks to the nanostructure to complete a cycle. So we hope to hear is, we, is it possible in addition to tuning the co first coordination environment, the second coordination environment, with the use of nanostructure, we can further control the micro environment of the, a lot of catalysis. And that using this kind of spatial control, we can generate the late cycles that we may not thought of, and we may think they are incompatible to each other in homogeneous media. And I hope that I'm very excited and looking forward to more collaborations with everyone in the center to using these ideas to see what kind of new chemical reactivities we can achieve. With that, thanks. And I'd like to turn it back to Paula. Thank you, John. Um, so in the last few minutes, I want to uh, showcase a couple of examples that um, are not exactly switchable catalysis or spatially separated, but I think are related to integrated catalysis. Um, Probably um, all of you here know that in 2016, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was um, awarded for molecular molars um, to Jean-Pierre Sauvage, who was the first one to look at molecular knots, um, Fraser Stoddard, who studied uh, rotoxanes, and Ben Feringa, who looked at molecular molars. I'm actually not gonna talk about their work. I do want to mention um, Michael Schmittel's work on uh, using metal ligand coordination um, to generate basically supramolecular assemblies that can do um, catalysis. I'm also not going to discuss that in detail. Um, what I want to show you is an example from David um, Lee's work at um, University of Manchester now um, on what at the time was called um, an artificial ribosome. So he uses uh, rotoxanes. Um, it's basically schematically presented here. Um, and on the rod, there are already positioned three different amino acids. On the rotoxane, there is a functionality that has a thiol. And the thiol actually, um, in 
with certain reagents can uh, react, it can be activated and react with the carboxylate group. Um, and basically attack the carboxylate group. Once that happens, now the terminal amine group on the um, protoxane can attack the newly formed group, and that actually um, takes this amino acids and cleaves it off the rod and puts it at the end of this um, chain. And that can actually, uh, Keep going, and this way they synthesize um, tripeptide, um, and in a way that mimics how um, ribosomes actually um, generate DNA by using messenger RNA. Another um, idea I want to talk about is actually um, bringing in robotics and artificial intelligence to catalysis. Um, this is something that a lot of people think about. Um, we use separately robotics and artificial um, intelligence. The idea is to actually start now um, thinking at the interface or like at the overlap of how we design synthesis, how we can use robotics, and how we can use um, computers to program everything. I will tell you about um, an example that was published uh, last year. But actually, um, even though that example shows how to synthesize molecules that um, we as humans um, have been able to synthesize before, the point of um, doing this integration is actually to be able to discover new reactions. This is work from Lee Cronin's group. And in uh, last year, in 2019, they published what they called the computer, which is um, kind of funny. Um, and they show that basically um, this is their setup where they combine uh, six syringe pumps um, and they use um, a round bottom flask, they use filtration, they use um, SEP funnels and the rotovab. And basically everything is controlled by a computer and they were able to synthesize um, three drug molecules, so then after rufinamine and nitol. Um, in yields that are comparable with uh, what is synthesized um, by humans and, and actually in slightly reduced times. With that, um, we're coming to the end of the presentation. Um, and I hope um, we impressed upon you that integrated catalysis is a system in which multiple catalysts can carry out sequences of reactions. Um, it can be achieved in various ways. The way that we in the center are thinking about is by using spatial and temporal control in order to overcome uh, incompatibility of multiple chaotic cycles. I'm not done, I need one more minute. I would like to thank my colleagues um, in the center. They were very helpful, very responsive. Um, as you could tell, some of their slides were, um, were theirs and um, actually um, only formatted by me a little bit. Thank you for their contribution and uh, presenting today. Um, I would like to tell you that our next webinar will be presented by Dan Wei Wong on October 20 on electrochemistry and batteries. We are trying to alternate synthetic molecular chemistry with materials chemistry uh, in the webinar series. Um, we do have a website which will be um, much prettier looking in a couple of weeks. Um, we are on Twitter. And also our students are working on monthly blogs on topics on um, sustainability and catalysis. And with that, thank you everybody and I'll be happy to answer questions. If we have questions. <laughs> okay, Paula, that was wonderful. Um, while people start thinking, there, there has been one, uh, one question from Amir Shahs for uh, Professor Liu, uh, he is he's wondering if you can expand a little bit on on this idea of using nanowires like a, a glove box. Oh yeah, so um, doesn't thanks thanks for the question. I guess I was uh, the question is asking me to elaborate about what micro sized glove box can do. Is that a question or um, how does the local environment uh, around the nanowire create a glove box? Yeah, so as we said that uh, um, at equilibrium, everything, the concentration will be equal. So the idea we thought about is 
and and, and in, in well come back to what we usually have the big glove box you need to put energy in you need to put pumps you need to put a lot of energy or you need to have catalyst to take out the arching so you need to have energy input to maintain a non um, a concentration gradient inside and outside the glove box so that's the common you need you have to do that so we just take that idea and say other than using catalyst we're using electric chemistry to do that reaction so what happens here is you see that um the wires actually they are serving as an oxygen as an electrochemical electrode they are they are catalysts on top of that that can reduce the oxygen and uh, into into water in by doing the oxygen reduction reaction and because the oxygen needed to fuse in, and so as the tip of the wire array while doing the oxygen reduction reaction, so it's get harder and harder for the oxygen to penetrate into the glob box, in, in, sorry, into the wire array. And therefore, and, they, and if you do mathematical modeling, you realize that will be an exponential decay. So that means that within a few micrometers, you can quickly change the oxygen concentration, oxygen concentration from ambient into almost no oxygen. Um, very quickly. So that is our idea how we can generate a micro-sized uh, glove box using nanowire electrode. Thank you, John. We currently do not have any other questions in the chat room. Okay. Um, but we still have some people, maybe um, if we don't have questions, I guess we can end. It is uh, one hour already. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, everybody, and uh, see you again. Well, well, actually, we do have a question. Okay. Sorry, from, <laughs> from John New and, and at our neural department. Uh, John asks, the artificial rim ribosome is interesting. Can you give one example of on how spatially controlled catalysis, how spa spatially controlled catalysts to generate sequence of events? How are you going to do that? How we envision that? Okay, so I'm going to go back to the slide in the beginning. We're not going to talk specifics uh, because we don't know if we're going to do it. So we, we're not divulging any secrets. But <clears throat> here's um, here here is a simple simpler example and the more complicated example. Basically, um, if we want to combine two reagents um, and start with a sim very simple um, gas, for example, um, we would need to generate, let's say, a different reagent for the reaction to take place. In that way, we're actually thinking of um, having one compartment to the electrochemical generation of this new reagent. And then another compartment, basically, that um, can bring in the second reagent. And, and then we can control this reaction both by separating how these two reactions occur, but also when the second reaction occurs. That's a little bit simpler example. And then more complicated is basically now um, coming in with more than two reagents um, and doing sequences of reactions. So here is, let's say, um, now we are not even using this step. We have our desired reagents. We make, let's say, this alternating copolymer, but we want to introduce some functionality in the backbone of this uh, polymer or different monomers, then um, we basically need to turn off, let's say, this reactions and be able to bring in another reaction. This is how we would use switchable catalysis. And to show how we integrate spatial, spatial catalysis, this reagent, again, is generated separately, um, let's say, by electrochemistry. Um, this is conceptually how we're envisioning of getting from um, simple blocks that is like, you know, rectangles to something complicated that looks like this. Excellent. Let's do it. Yes. <laughs>
if we have if we don't have any more questions then we can all go to the lab yeah, <laughs> and you know talk to our students well actually not really talk at least not at ucla but <laughs> um engage with our students are, are there no more questions no there, there aren't any more questions a lot of nice comments okay okay well thank you everybody we are recording this and please tell your friends and we will be posting it on our website and again, see you in four weeks. Thank you. Bye.